Autophagy is translated into self-eating, autophagy. And it's a form of protein degradation that occurs inside the cytoplasm of cells, where cells form a double membrane vesicle around a portion of cytoplasm, and then traffic those vesicles to the lysosome in the cell. And after fusion of the autophagosomes with the lysosomes, the lysosomal enzymes degrade the autophagic contents. The process was first described or given a name by the Nobel laureate Christian de Duve in around 1963. And it took about 20 years before people really had powerful tools to start discovering how autophagy works and why it's important. And these resulted from a series of genetic screens in yeast that were performed by Yoshinori Uzumi and colleagues and subsequently groups like Dan Kleonsky. These pioneering yeast studies then led to the identification of the orthologous human genes or the orthologous mammalian genes that enabled studies not only in cell-based systems but also in a number of animal models to allow a better understanding of the physiological importance of autophagy. Those studies have now revealed that autophagy is important for a wide range of different processes. The original studies in yeast suggest that it's an important defense against starvation. And indeed, that primordial property is something that's conserved even into mammals. So if you've got newborn mice, they require autophagy in order to survive the period between birth and the establishment of breastfeeding. However, subsequent studies have revealed a wide range of additional functions where autophagy is very important for physiology and for protection against disease. So I'll give you a few examples. One example is in the context of neurodegenerative disease, an area that we've worked on a lot. We discovered that, is, that autophagy is important for allowing cells and neurons to degrade aggregate prone proteins, which are poisonous for the cells in diseases like Huntington's disease, some forms of Parkinson's disease, and other forms of dementia. In addition to this, we found, and others have replicated the idea, that if one increases the rate of autophagy, one can speed up the degradation and removal of such toxic proteins from the cell, and thereby have some type of beneficial effect in a range of cell and animal models of these types of diseases. Autophagy is similarly important in various infectious diseases. So a number of groups, including those of Ojo Deretic and others, and Beth Levine have shown that autophagy is important for getting rid of certain bacteria and viruses from cells. A third area where autophagy appears to be very important is in cancers. In cancers, the role of autophagy is more complex than in the simple neurodegenerative disease scenarios that I've discussed. Because in cancers, it appears that a failure to have proper autophagy predisposes organisms to the establishment of cancers. However, once the cancers are already there and are prone to metastasizing, then autophagy ends up being potentially permissive for the ongoing survival of the metastatic tumors. However, that simplistic um, description of what's going on is probably not the whole truth because autophagy plays many roles in immune surveillance of cancers as well. And so the situation might be much more complex and might also be influenced by the specific type of cancer one is talking about. So the current work in the field um, is focused probably around three main areas. The one area is to actually try to understand how autophagy works in cells. So how are the autophagosomes built? The description I gave you at the beginning is that they are double membrane vesicles. So how does a cell actually form double membrane vesicles? How does it control where the double membrane vesicles are in the cells? And how does it regulate their rate of formation? The experiments that had been done in the yeast screens and follow-up studies in mammalian cells with the yeast orthologs have revealed that there are more than 30 so-called ATG, standing for autophagy genes, which regulate the process. So a major challenge for researchers today is to try to understand how their activities are coordinated. A second main area of interest in the fields is to try to understand what the consequences are of autophagy dysfunction. 
So I mentioned earlier that autophagy dysfunction potentially um, makes organisms more vulnerable to certain neurodegenerative diseases or certain types of infectious diseases. The challenge there is to understand more subtle phenotypes. So what is going on when one has a rather modest defect in autophagy as is more likely to occur um, in a patient with a particular disease? Um, and there a variety of tools are emerging that allow one to start asking those questions with a greater degree of realism than simply using a knockout mouse model. For instance, Skip Virgin, a colleague of mine in the United States, has developed uh, an elegant hypermorphic mouse model which has slightly defective function of autophagy which is much more likely to reflect what is going on in a physiological situation than a complete knockout. A third exciting area in the field is to see how we can harness our understanding of this basic cell biological process which has so many important roles for treating diseases. Myala have is a specific interest in neurodegenerative diseases and in order to try to see if we can exploit the cell biology towards disease therapy, we've undertaken a large number of studies, including chemical screens, to identify drugs that can be used to upregulate autophagy. We found drugs from large library screens, but in, in a sense, our most exciting data to date are with drugs that came from a screen that we did of a library that was highly enriched in compounds that had been used for other purposes previously in man. And from that screen, we identified a fairly large number of drugs that had been used for other purposes that could upregulate autophagy in cell-based systems. Some of these drugs potentially can get into the brain, um, and we've been trying to understand the particular pathways by which those drugs act to induce autophagy, um, and then seeing if we can mimic the situation seen in man in mouse models, where we give the mouse models of various diseases those types of drugs and test whether those drugs at realistic concentrations can induce autophagy in the brain of mouse models. So far, we've been working a lot in Huntington's disease mouse models, where we get good readouts for autophagy and show that some of these drugs, um, when given to the mice, can ameliorate the symptoms and can enhance the degradation rate of the toxic protein causing Huntington's disease. So what is the outlook for the future for people studying autophagy? I still think it's important to have a better understanding of the basic cell biology of the process because it's only by understanding the cell biology and the underlying signaling that we'll really have a deep, option, deep range of options to explore therapeutic targets or rational therapeutic targets. On the other hand, I think we need to pursue our ideas that autophagy might be a therapeutic um, strategy for various neurodegenerative diseases and do studies in mouse models um, at the highest possible level to try to build a case to motivate for further studies in humans. Finally, I think we still don't know very much about all the different types of targets and diseases and processes that would be dysregulated if autophagy were compromised. And this is relevant because autophagy is or appears to be compromised in a number of human diseases. And so to that end, um, we need to understand all the downstream targets, the substrates and the signaling events that might be perturbed when autophagy is compromised. A recent example which relates to the types of things that can go wrong when autophagy is compromised mildly relates to stem cells. So Xiaoting Wu, who just finished a PhD in my lab, found in cell-based systems that if you impair autophagy, then you increase the activity of the notch signaling pathway. Um, and she went on to show in mouse models that this occurs also in the mouse models if you have impaired autophagy. And the consequence of that is a failure or progression of various stem cells, including neuronal stem cells, to a more differentiated state. Um, and so even in the brain of these mice, there is impaired differentiation of stem cells into the adult neurons. And so this gives one example of the types of things that can go wrong when autophagy is not working properly. A major challenge for the field is now to try to understand how autophagy is modulated or can be varied under various situations of stress or disease, but not only in cells, but also in an in vivo situation. Conventionally, in cell-based systems, autophagy is measured 
by studying the levels of various proteins or modified proteins and by Western blotting, or by measuring the number of water phagosomes and water lysosomes by light microscopy or electron microscopy. Clearly, that doesn't allow one to measure autophagy dynamically in vivo. Um, so a variety of tools are available to start allowing us to, to get to those types of measurements. One of the tools that might enable a better assessment of how autophagy is modulated in living organisms is to tag an autophagosome associated protein with a green fluorescent protein and a red fluorescent protein. Simplistically, the autophagosomes are yellow, they're both green and red when they are non-acidified, but when they get to the lysosomes, the green fluorescence is quenched and so one is left with red-only vesicles. So by computing the number of red-only vesicles versus the number of yellow vesicles, one can get an idea of the autophagic flux. However, this type of method is still not ideal because it doesn't allow one to measure autophagy in a living organism in real time. And I think a key objective of future work will be to try to resolve methods that allow one to do such things.